traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. A journey of which your traveling partners are somehow familiar, even though you've never met them yourself. You have just crossed over into the Equestrian Zone. Lyra's eyes slowly opened as the sun came through the bedroom window. It took her a few moments to register the dream she'd been having was over. She lifted herself up to find she was the same pony as she'd ever been. Two bright teal hooves pointed at her. Another fell slightly out of the sheets, and a fourth wrapped around the leg of her sleeping partner. Nope, Lyra thought. Still don't have hands. Unable to lie back down and return to sleep, Lyra got up and went over to the mail slot. The slot kept rattling and rattling as Lyra heard a crinkling of paper from the other side. Lyra went over to and opened the door to find a familiar gray pegasus with blonde hair trying to shove mail into the mail slot. Why don't I take that off your hooves, Ditsy? Lyra yawned. Oops, Ditsy said. My bad. She took the mail in her hoof and extended it to Lyra, who quickly grabbed it with her unicorn magic and set it down on a small table nearby. Oh, and there's one more thing here, too. Lyra stared in confusion as, at Ditsy as she rifled through her postal carrier bag. Other ponies' mail went flying all over the place until the Pegasus pulled out a small wooden box with a metal lock on it. Lyra took the box and examined it, noticing something was etched on its lid. Is that all? she asked, suddenly awake. For today, Ditsy said cheerily. Well, I've got to get going now. Lots of mail to deliver. Bye! Lyra ignored Ditsy trying to collect all the dropped mail and went inside with the box. Upon closer inspection... The box was of a very fine and polished oak, and was made with such skill that Lyra assumed it was a jewelry box from Canterlot. While a very fine thing to think, Lyra knew no such pony in Ponyville that would have the necessary funds in order to buy one of them. And the metal lock was made from such a strong metal that Lyra's magic couldn't break it open. Setting the box on the kitchen counter for a moment... Lyra turned her attention to the other mail she had been given. There was a bill from the electric company, a bill from the gas company, a bill for a credit card, a notice that the available bid amount was lowered for said credit card because of failure to pay it back, and a letter for the upcoming taxes. Lyra had at least been hoping for acceptance to her application for the local Ponyville Symphony, ran by Octavia, who also was first chair cellist, though wanted to go back to Canterlot, in order to be able to practice with them. Even a simple job response from the bank would be enough, but the fact remained that Lyra was astoundingly in debt. A groan from the adjacent room told Lyra her roommate was awake. The beige pony with a frazzled pink and blue mane slouched over to the kitchen and pulled out a pan and some eggs. Mail come in this morning? She said. Bonbon? Bon? Lyra asked. Aren't you supposed to be receiving a paycheck soon? Why do you ask? Bonbon bon said, turning around to face the teal and white pony. Lyra shoved the stack of bills over to her. Bonbon bon quickly sorted through them with her hoof and sighed. <sighs> if only the cakes would promote me higher than that pinky pie. I swear, she makes a total mess of the kitchen while I am neat and organized. I don't know why they keep her on. Anyways, if they did, I'd be getting a bigger pay and we wouldn't be in this mess. She turned back around and continued cooking eggs for two. Lyra and Bonbon bon went to eat at a small table when the latter noticed the box still sitting on the counter. What's that? I don't know, Lyra responded. Is it a jewelry box? Bonbon bon asked, confused. I don't think so, Lyra said. 
Neither of us wear jewelry. What would we need a jewelry box for? Bonbon bon went over to the box and grabbed it with her mouth before bringing it over to where she and Lyra were eating. There's something etched on it. Read it then. Bonbon bon turned the box around until she could see it right side up. You have been given this box courtesy of a very special friend. This friend shall come around this night wearing a cloak as black as oil. You will be given a choice. Lyra blinked. Sounds like a bunch of nonsense. I agree, Bon Bon said as she finished her eggs. I'll take it with me and throw it in the trash on my way to work. She washed her dishes and packed a small salad to take with her before heading for the door. Are you playing today? Practicing for tomorrow, Lyra said. There's supposed to be a festival tomorrow night in the park, and I want to be ready for it. Twilight let me borrow a book of musical compositions from the library a week ago. Very well, Bon Bon said, and headed out the door. I'll be home sometime this afternoon. And she left. Lyra finished her egg, then went to pluck some strings. Later that evening, after Bon Bon had returned home and dinner had been eaten, Lyra went to practice her lyre again in the bedroom. She was interrupted after the first few notes by a strange knocking coming from the door. Who's that knocking on the door? Bon Bon shouted from the living room. A friend! The voice resounded throughout the house, like the royal canterlot voice. A very special friend. Lyra went to the living room and looked at Bon Bon, attempting to peek out the mail slot. You get it, she said quickly. Lyra walked carefully towards the door and opened it. Standing outside was a very large pony in a black cloak that almost made her blend in with the night. The pony had a dark blue coat that was barely indistinguishable from cloak, and nothing else could be seen of it other than piercing white eyes and a blue aura that held a familiar box. Bon Bon screamed. The stranger walked into the house uninvited, passing an astonished Lyra, before setting the box on the table where they had eaten dinner earlier that evening. A single hoof waved Lyra and Bon Bon over, and the two ponies went over to the table and sat down in the chairs the pony had magicked out for them. I've come here with a proposition, the pony began, speaking much quieter. One that deals with this box. What sort of box is it? Lyra asked. A special sort of box, the pony said. Inside this box is a muffin. A muffin? Bon Bon scoffed as she regained her former composure. What would we need a muffin for? This is starting to sound a bit overblown to me. Now, now, the pony chided. Don't be so quick to judge. You see, there are special properties attached to this muffin. Firstly, it is a special chocolate chip muffin. A blue ribbon prize winning muffin at the Canterlot Dessert Competition from 15 years ago and has been regarded as the most perfect muffin to have ever existed. The recipe has been kept secret by one family, one family that you know very well. It's still just a muffin, Lyra commented. Ah, but with this muffin are magical properties. Things can change at the slightest whim of whoever eats it. Not beyond reason, of course. But the side effects of eating it can be very strange. So what is your proposition regarding this muffin? Bon Bon asked. You have two choices. Eat the muffin or don't eat the muffin. Do not eat the muffin and you will be given a prize equivalent to its worth. Eat the muffin and you will be given a hundred thousand bits. But something will happen in regards to your cutie mark. Lyra looked at her liar. Bon Bon stared at the three pieces of candy. You have three days, 
the figure continued without waiting for a response. At the end of those three days, I shall come back and either take back the muffin and give you your prize, or I shall watch you eat the muffin, and you shall obtain the hundred thousand bits and whatever price your cutie mark shall pay. And you'll need this to open it. The pony brought out a small silver key. Good night. Again, without waiting for a response, the pony walked out of the house and disappeared in what Lyra could only describe as a tacky cloud of purple smoke. Well, Lyra said after a long moment of silence, what do you think? Bon Bon turned to Lyra as though dazed. What do you mean? What should we do about this box? Bon Bon's head faced the floor. I think we should go to bed. In the morning, we'll wake up and find out this has all been some sort of strange dream. Our lives will go on as normal, I guess. Although she was trying to sound as tough about the issue as she had earlier, Lyra could tell that Bon Bon had no energy. I suppose you're right, the unicorn said. Lyra's eyes slowly opened as the sun came through the bedroom window. It took her a few moments to register the dream she'd been having was over. She lifted herself up to find she was the same pony as she had ever been. Two bright teal hooves pointed at her, another fell slightly out of the sheets, and a fourth wrapped around the leg of her sleeping partner. Nope, Lyra thought. Still don't have hands. Unable to go back to sleep... Lyra got up from bed and decided to make herself breakfast so she could get started with practicing for that evening's festival. Lyra lazily trotted to the kitchen and began making herself breakfast before turning her attention to the small oak box that sat on the table. It wasn't a dream, Lyra thought. We really do have this box. Taking her breakfast over to the table... Lyra sat and stared at the box. She looked over it again and again, from the etchings to the lock to the silver key next to the box. Bonbon bon had yet to wake up, and Lyra decided that it wouldn't hurt to just peek at the muffin. Taking the silver key and steadying it in the lock, Lyra turned the key until she heard a small click come from the interior of the box taking her hooves and carefully opening the box. Inside, as the stranger from the night before had said, there was a muffin. A small wisp of steam rose from the top of the lightly brown muffin. Lyra could see small chocolate chips scattered around the muffin. Forgetting her unicorn magic, Lyra took her hooves and gently lifted the muffin out of the box and brought it up to her nose. The muffin was soft, but held up against the pressure from Lyra's hooves. She smelled the muffin and noticed she was starting to drool. There was no doubt about it. This was the perfect muffin. Lyra! A voice shouted from somewhere nearby, startling the unicorn. What are you doing with that muffin? Were you going to eat it? N no Lyra said, placing the muffin back into the box with her magic. I was just taking a look at it. I had to make sure it was real. Thank goodness, Bon Bon said, still annoyed. Who knows what would have happened if you had eaten that dang thing. Lyra whined. Oh, don't look at me that way, Bon Bon said. Just remember, we have three days to make a decision before that stranger comes back. Lyra nodded. You're playing at the festival tonight? Bon Bon said. Yeah. Lyra said. I'll be practicing for most of the day. All right. I hope the cakes will let me out early to join up with you, but don't wait for me. Okay. Hope work goes better than yesterday. Bon Bon smiled as Lyra left the room to go practice. Bon Bon hadn't returned home by the time of the start of the festival, so Lyra left for the park on her own, her lyre levitating next to her in its case. She wasn't as quick as other ponies all around her were, 
feeling slightly apprehensive about how ponies would react to her playing. The Harvest Festival was a big thing at Sweet Apple Acres, and Lyra hoped she would be able to get even a small audience. The festival was crowded and well-lit before Lyra even arrived. The teal unicorn went around and said hi to some of her friends, not mentioning the box with the muffin when someone asked her how her week had been going. A few others suggested going to the unemployment office when Lyra mentioned her debt, but Lyra only smiled weakly and said, I'll think about it, before trotting off. A small stage was set up for small talent acts, and a small fee was required for entry. Even though the price to enter was small, Lyra found that she didn't have the proper funds in order to be able to join. No need to worry, said a voice from somewhere near her. Lyra looked around, dropping her lyre case and nearly screaming from surprise as she noticed the pony in the black cloak standing next to her. Your entry price has already been paid, and you are on that list, the voice said as though not taking notice of Lyra's reaction. The larger pony sighed. I hope you do well on this most wonderful of nights. Perhaps even the stars themselves shall aid you. Lyra looked over at the booth for the stage, then turned back to where the pony was standing. Or rather, had been standing. Just as soon as Lyra turned her head around, the pony was no longer there. Lyra blinked stupidly for a moment before walking over to the booth. "'What's your name?' the unicorn at the table asked. "'Lyra,' Lyra responded. The unicorn flipped through a few pieces of paper. "'You're the one playing the liar?" Y "'Yes,' Lyra responded. The unicorn nodded and returned the papers to their original state. "'Come with me.' You'll be allowed on stage in five minutes, and you'll have ten to twenty minutes of time to play whatever you want. You can place your case out for tips if you'd like. Are you ready? Lyra nodded as the unicorn took her behind the stage. Very well, then. Wait here for a few minutes, and I'll announce your name when we're ready. Lyra nodded again and sat down, taking out her lyre to polish it and tune the strings. When she was finished... She waited anxiously for the unicorn to call her name. When he did, Lyra quietly walked on stage, settled herself on a pillow, and grabbed the microphone to move it closer to her lyre. She levitated the lyre in front of her and extended her hopes before beginning to gently pluck the strings of her first song. It wasn't long before Lyra found herself becoming lost in her playing. The tune was a simple one, one she had studied for weeks and found easy to play. The tune was a slow one, played calmly upon the strings of her lyre. There were a few faster parts, but Lyra had mastered them with ease, and now quickly and smoothly played her lyre through those parts. Once or twice, she looked out to the audience to see a small crowd of ponies watching her in awe, and she smiled before returning to her work. A spotlight soon shone on Lyra as she continued playing her song. But soon it was all over, and she was met with excited cheers and ponies going up to the stage and placing bits in her case. The next song Lyra played was a simple olden hymn with slight variations in tempo and sound of her strings. Lyra wished she had some pony to back her up while she played, but the ponies still cheered with delight as she played her song. More ponies came to watch, and more ponies came to place bits in her case as Lyra continued, slightly embellishing the last portions of the song to make it even grander than just her alone. By the time she had finished with her second song, Lyra was exhausted, and the bits were falling out of her lyre case. Lyra bowed as the ponies cheered her again, and she closed up her case and began walking off the stage. That was quite the performance, came a sophisticated-sounding voice. Lyra looked around and just about squeed when she found who was looking for her. There was no mistaking the gray pony with the pink and white bow tie around her neck. Octavia? Lyra said delightedly. You, you were watching me perform? Yes, I was, and 
and I'm impressed. Not many ponies can play Clair de Luna on a piano, not to mention a liar like you did. Lyra felt something that was between giddiness and shock, though wasn't sure which one she felt more. Tell me, what's your name? Octavia asked. Lyra, the unicorn said as a smile grew on her face. I shall not be forgetting that performance any time soon, Lyra, Octavia said, a much more refined and restrained smile settling on her face. Well done. And she walked off. A little while later, a teal unicorn pony was seen laughing delightedly as she hopped around the fair like Pinkie Pie. It was later still when Lyra returned, worn out from happiness as she placed the bits into a small chest she kept next to her, before flopping onto the bed and immediately fell asleep. The next morning, Lyra was awakened by the sound of a click coming from the next room. Wondering who was making that noise so early in the morning, she walked out of the bedroom to see Bonbon bon fiddling with the box with the muffin inside of it. Bonbon, bon, Lyra said. Where were you last night while I was at the festival? I was also at the festival, Bonbon bon growled. Working. Bonbon's quickness to anger upset Lyra, and she walked over to the table and sat down with Bonbon. Bon. What happened? The cakes needed an extra worker at the festival, Bonbon bon said. I was working until late last night, but all that running around made me stay awake. I haven't slept since yesterday. Um, do you get the day off? Thankfully. But I can't stand working there any longer, Bonbon bon shouted, nearly startling Lyra out of her chair. Pinkie Pie always messes up everything I do. I try to make something, but it fails miserably because she wants to interfere to try something new. She's always dragging me away from my work in order for me to help her with some little project she has. The cakes do nothing to stop her, and always are saying I should help her out. And I hardly am getting any overtime for the hours I had to work for the, at the fair, because the cakes need the money to buy more supplies, because Pinky keeps using them. Lyra had no idea what to say. Um... Bonbon? Bonbon shot a death glare to Lyra, who recoiled but continued onward. I made some money at the festival last night from the talent stage. I was also talked to by Octavia. Wonderful, Bonbon said, but showed no joy or excitement. You got back the entry fee, I'm assuming. No, more than that. Bonbon raised an eyebrow. Show me. Lyra brought out the chest full of bits and placed it on the table and opened it so that Bonbon bon could see. Together, Lyra and Bonbon bon started taking out the bits and counting them until small stacks of bits filled the table. It's... it's enough money to pay off all of our debts, Bonbon bon said. So, we don't need to eat the muffin for the money, Lyra said. Bonbon bon growled. Are you crazy? she said, a maniacal look in her eye. Her voice became deeper and faster the longer she continued. This is only enough to pay off this month's debts. It won't be enough to pay off any other debts we might incur. This meager amount is nothing compared to the hundred thousand bits we get if we eat that muffin. But what about our cutie marks? Lyra pleaded. If something bad happens to my liar cutie mark... I might not be able to keep playing. And, and what if it happens to yours? It's possible we'd have the 100,000 bits, but not a way to keep adding bits to that. And let's not forget a prize for not eating that muffin. Do you want to know how much a muffin is worth? Bonbon bon asked. About two bits, Lyra said. What prize is there going to be if we don't eat it, then? Bonbon bon said. What sort of life-changing reward will we get if we don't eat it? Nothing. What about my cutie mark? I had Octavia come up to me today and applaud me for my performance. She might even ask me to join the Ponyville Symphony Orchestra. What would happen if my cutie mark were to change? There's the possibility of you becoming the best lyre player Equestria has ever known. There's also the possibility of you becoming the worst chef Equestria has ever known. I say we should eat it. 
Bonbon bon shouted, raising herself up with the table as she stood on her hind legs. I say we shouldn't eat it, Lyra said as she rose to match Bonbon's bon height. Should. Should it. Should. Should it. We are going to eat that muffin. We are not going to eat that muffin. Fine, Bonbon bon shrieked. If you won't eat it, then I will all by myself when that stranger comes around tomorrow. And you won't have a single bite of it. Say goodbye to a taste of the single most perfect muffin ever made, because it's all mine. Using her magic, Lyra flipped the table over, sending both Bonbon bon and the box flying backwards. Fine then, she said. Be that way. Don't care about what happens to our cutie marks and she stormed off to the bedroom, locking it so that Bonbon bon couldn't get in, before settling down uneasily and waiting until the next night, or at least until her roommate calmed down. The next morning, Lyra carefully unlocked the bedroom door and slowly walked out to see Bonbon bon sitting at the table, staring intently at the box as though it was going to move. Bonbon? Bon? Lyra asked. Bonbon bon didn't move. Have you eaten anything? Lyra asked. Bonbon bon slowly shook her head. Do you want anything? Bonbon bon slowly shook her head again. Lyra gulped, but walked over to the table all the same and sat down. The two remained at the table, staring at the box for a long time. You won't be eating the muffin with me? Bonbon bon asked. No, Lyra responded. Fine. Bonbon bon fell silent again. The silence was not broken until that evening, when a knock came at the door. Lyra slowly got up and walked over to the door as she opened it with her magic to reveal the now familiar cloaked figure standing at the door. Have you made your decision? The figure said. My roommate is going to eat the muffin, Lyra said. The figure stared at her with the whites of its eyes. And what about yourself? I will not be partaking in the muffin. You won't be getting any prize. It'll keep my mind at ease. Only your friend shall get the reward of the hundred thousand bits, and the price paid only to her cutie mark. I will take that risk of not getting the reward. The cloaked pony nodded and walked inside to where Bonbon bon was at the table looking at the box. Taking the silver key, the figure opened the box and brought out the muffin with its magic, handing it to Bonbon. Bon. You must eat the entire muffin for you to get the reward. Bonbon bon nodded. The cloaked pony brought the muffin over to Bonbon's bon's mouth, the wisp of smoke still rising from the top. Bonbon bon bit into the muffin, and Lyra heard a mmm come from her roommate's mouth as she chewed the muffin. Lyra could only watch with mixed feelings of regret and satisfaction as she merely smelled the muffin from afar. When Bonbon bon was finished, the cloaked figure brought over a napkin for her to wipe her face on, then threw the napkin in the trash and began levitating the box with her magic as she walked out the door. Wait! Lyra found herself shouting. The cloaked pony turned around. Your choice has been made, she said. It's not about that. What? What happens next? The bits shall be placed into your friend's bank account in two days' time. The effect on her cutie mark shall be present by tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the box shall be taken to someone else, and the same offer shall be presented with a new muffin inside of it. Though the pony had answered the question, she didn't move. Do you have another question for me? Lyra gulped as Bonbon bon walked over, intrigued. What was the prize we would have gotten? The pony laughed a bit. Do you know how many bits this muffin is sold for? Lyra shook her head. Five bits, 
the pony said. It can go up to seven bits in places like Canterlot in Philadelphia. A small price to pay for a pony looking for the best possible muffin. Do you know how many are sold each year? Lyra again shook her head, feeling something cold and wet roll down her cheek. Thousands. Thousands of this type of muffin are sold everywhere to ponies far and wide. Had your friend not succumbed to her greed, I'm sure the cakes would have been willing to show you how to make the muffin. Alas, should you talk to them now, they would pretend they do not know, and you shan't find it in writing anywhere. It's a family secret. Both Lyra's and Bon Bon's mouths dropped. Anyways, the pony said, I hope you have fun with your cutie mark. I doubt you'll be seeing me again any time soon. Goodbye. And she vanished in a tacky cloud of purple smoke, leaving no trace she had ever been there. I'm going to bed, Bon Bon said, leaving a dumbstruck Lyra at the door. After Bon Bon left for work the next morning, Lyra sat down and took her bits to pay for all the bills they had received in the mail, before taking them to the post office to send back her payments. When she was done, she went over to Sugar Cube Corner and ordered a chocolate chip muffin. It smelled nothing like the one she had been offered and even tasted slightly dry, but it was good enough for her. A familiar face saw Lyra sitting in the shop eating the muffin and walked out from the kitchen. Lyra, Bon Bon said, enjoying your muffin? I don't think I'll enjoy it as much as you did last night, Lyra responded. Hey, I'm sorry about that whole thing these last few days, Bon Bon said apologetically. I didn't mean to be so hard on you about the whole thing. I promise you, I'll share the reward when it comes. It's fine, Lyra said. You got to taste the most perfect muffin in the world, and you look like you enjoyed it. Be happy you got to experience a rare thing, and that we finally have some money for us now. True, Bon Bon said. But there's something else. What is it? Lyra asked. Hold on, I'll be right back. Bon Bon left for the kitchen and returned with a small plate with two small pieces of confectionery on it. I think I may have perfected my recipe. Bon Bon said excitedly. I knew it was these things that were my cutie mark, but I haven't made them in so long. Anyways, I want you to be the first taste tester and tell me how it goes. Thank you, Bon Bon, Lyra said happily and picked up one of the pieces of confectionery. And congratulations on the recipe. Thank you, but come on, try it. Lyra happily took the piece and put it in her mouth, exploding with sweet and salty flavor as she bit into it. She may not have had the muffin, but as she took the second bite of her treat, she found it to be just as good. She savored the flavor as she gulped it all down. That's... that's... Lyra was going to say, that's excellent! But something else caught her eye. Well, Bon Bon asked, what do you think? Bon Bon, you're cutie mark. What happened? Bon Bon turned around to see what Lyra was pointing at. Her eyes widened in surprise as she saw that the normally blue and yellow candy wrappers emblazoned on her flank had turned into a mixture of sickly green colors. Lyra almost couldn't believe her eyes even as she stared right at them. Suddenly, her stomach dropped and started churning. The world became blurred, and she found it hard to stay in her chair. Lyra's head swam as she struggled to stay upright, as Bon Bon tried calling out to her. But her voice was so distant and echoed so much that Lyra could not understand what she was saying. Lyra lost her balance and fell off the chair and onto the floor of Sugar Cube Corner. The last thing Lyra heard was the sound of sirens approaching.
as was par for the course, Pinkie Pie just couldn't seem to stop talking. And then she whooshed down so fast that she did a sonic rainbow. And then she was coming down so fast but still so far up that she did another rainbow right after that. And then she kept flying around the clouds so fast that they all formed a rainbow-colored tornado and the air started blowing around me. And it was just so incredible it's amazing that I could help myself and I jumped up in the air and went, Yahoo! Rainbow Dash! Isn't that right, Dashy? Yeah, Dashy replied. Sure, we've always heard this story five times before, Pinky. When are you going to stop telling me? But I was just telling it again to Ditsy Doo and Cloud Kicker, Pinky explained. The other five times were to Twilight, Verity, and Sweetie Belle, Fluttershy, Applejack, and Big Macintosh, and Apple Bloom, and Scootaloo. Ditsy and Cloud Kicker hadn't heard it before. Nice work, Rainbow Dash, Ditsy said. I saw the rainbow while eating a muffin at Sugar Cube Corner. See? It's just like when you saved those ponies, only a lot cooler because no one else can do a rainbow like you can. Come to think of it, I don't think anyone else can do a rainbow at all. Rainbow Dash sighed. Pinky, I know I agreed to hanging out with you today, but can you give it a break? Ever since we've sat down to lunch, all you've been able to do is tell other ponies the story of that trick that I did a week ago. Besides, you haven't even eaten your own lunch. Pinky looked down at her pile of hay fries and a daffodil and daisy sandwich, left alone for the last twenty minutes on her plate. No sweat, Pinky said and proceeded to eat the entire plate in a single swish of her tongue. That's... kind of gross, Dash said. But it works. Shall we? I've got an amazing prank to pull on Applejack today. Okie dokie loki, Pinky said, hopping up and down happily. Just wait here one second. I want to tell Mr. and Mrs. Cake about the trick. Dash sighed as Pinky ran off. How about we just do this another day, she said to no one in particular, and walked off towards Twilight's to see about getting another Daring Do book. Daring Do, Twilight asked. I know I recently had a copy of Daring Do in the Kingdom of the Crystal Ponies donated a short while ago. Is that okay? Nah, Dash said. I've already seen the Crystal Ponies myself. We all did. Alright. Well, I'm sure I have something here on the shelves. Come with me. Rainbow Dash followed Twilight into the main room of the library and watched as Twilight began scanning the shelves. It didn't take long, and soon Dash was holding a copy of Daring Do and the Arabian Nightmare in her hooves as Twilight stamped the book as checked out. Something bothering you lately? Twilight asked. I didn't expect you to be coming by here. I thought you were hanging out with Pinkie Pie today. Well, I was, but I just can't get that pony to stop talking, Dash said. I had this amazing prank I was going to pull on Applejack today by painting some of the regular apple trees different colors to look like different apples. But then Pinky started talking about a trick I did last week to every pony that was passing by. She ended up running off to tell more ponies about it and left me at the restaurant we went to lunch to alone. Twilight frowned sympathetically. Well, if you wanted to have some time off from Pinky, you could propose a wager. A wager? Dash asked. Aren't ponies only allowed to make bets in Lost Pegasus? Consider it a friendly competition, Twilight replied. What exactly would be the terms of this competition? What exactly would be the terms of the competition? Well... We could put Pinky in a small room with everything she needs to live and in a place where every pony could see her. We then enchant the room so that if she talks, we'll notice and she'll lose the competition. Dash thought about this for a minute. Pinkie Pie being silent for any length of time was unbelievable. But to post a competition that could see just how long she could be silent? That... That was brilliant. Something only a pony like Twilight could come up with. Dash grinned. A competition? Pinky asked. You mean, like a game? Exactly like a game, Dash said. We'd put you in a little magical chamber that Twilight's going to make, and you would have to remain silent for just one year. We'd give you whatever food you need and whatever supplies you'd need, 
and all you'd have to do to communicate is write little messages on a slip of paper that could be delivered to whatever pony you wanted them to. And to make it interesting, I'll throw in 10,000 bits if you manage to last that long. I'll do it, Pinky said. I just need to get some things organized with the cakes and rarity, but I should be ready for it in a month's time. Oh, Dashie, this is going to be so fun! Wait until I tell Cloud Kicker and Ditsy and Big Mac and Applejack and Rarity and Sweetie Belle. <gasps> and I'd be able to help Mr. and Mrs. Cake with the bills I've been having lately. Oh, I've only been making cupcakes lately, but they'll need a new fridge, a new oven, a new mixing bowl, a new set of spoons. One month later, the chamber was set up in the center of Ponyville near the town hall in Carousel Boutique. A widely traveled area. The chamber was made entirely out of glass with a door on one side that had a slot in the center of it and contained a bed, a dresser, per Pinky's request, and a table, in addition to a large stack of index cards with a few quills and bottles of ink nearby. The entire chamber had a pinkish glow to it courtesy of Twilight's sound detection magic that she had placed on it. To the right of the door, there was a contract written out. Miss Pinkie Pie has agreed on this date to stay inside this magical chamber for one year without speaking a word. If she should make it one year without speaking, she will be awarded a prize of 10,000 bits by Miss Rainbow Dash as soon as she exits the chamber. If not, Pinkie Pie is to leave the chamber whenever the alarm goes off and shall pay Rainbow Dash 2,000 bits in defeat. Twilight was present with Rainbow Dash as ponies began to gather at the side of the glass chamber. Soon, it felt like the entirety of Ponyville was present that morning. The ponies were all looking at Carousel Boutique, where Pinkie Pie had been seen entering earlier that morning, under the pretense she was going to speak with Rarity for a minute before agreeing to the competition. Rainbow Dash stomped her hooves impatiently and flew into the air for a minute. What's taking Pinkie Pie so long? she asked no one in particular. Is she chickening out? A few minutes later, Dash got her answer. Pinkie Pie emerged with Rarity next to her, adjusting a scarf that Pinkie had placed around her neck. The two trotted forward, with Rarity carrying a rather large, transparent plastic bag filled with shirts, scarves, and sweaters that Pinkie was allowed to take into the room. Pinky trotted over and stood across from Rainbow Dash, who stood next to the contract. Twilight went up to a podium and began to announce the crowd. Ponies who are present, we are here today to watch as Pinkie Pie and Rainbow Dash begin their competition. Once Pinkie signs the contract currently placed on the side of the chamber, she will be unable to speak for an entire year and must remain inside the chamber at all times. Rainbow took the quill and signed her name on the contract before handing over the quill to Pinky, who had yet to say a word since leaving Carousel Boutique. Pinky signed the contract, then looked at Rainbow Dash as though expecting something. Ready for this, Pinky? Dash challenged. Pinky nodded. Pinky Pie? Twilight asked, Could you please step inside the chamber? Pinkie Pie nodded, took the bag from Rarity in her mouth, and went inside the chamber. Good luck, dear, Rarity said. Twilight used her magic and locked the door, preventing any other pony from entering. Pinkie waved a hoof to all the others outside, then took a pad of paper and a crayon and began drawing. The competition had begun. For a long while, everything was the same in Ponyville. Pinky followed a much stricter schedule than any pony had ever seen, to the point where you could tell what time it was by her routine. If Pinky was waking up and eating a cupcake, the shops were beginning to open. When Pinky finished her cupcake and started drawing, most of the ponies were at work. When Pinky was delivered hay fries by Mr. or Mrs. Cake, it was lunchtime. If Pinky started reading a book, it was back to work. If Pinky had a sandwich with a side of alfalfa, it was dinner time. It got so precise that it went to days of the week. If Pinky decided to dance, it was the weekend and a day off. 
if Pinky was sending off a message to Twilight asking to check out some books. It was the first day back at work after the weekend. If Rainbow Dash came by to see if Pinky would give up her bet, and Pinky always wrote back, no, it was the second day of the week. If Pinky was sending off a message to Rarity to do something with one of her garments, it was the middle of the week. And if Rarity was bringing back said garment, it was the last day of work before the weekend. Not many ponies were too happy with the arrangement by the time a month had passed. I do not like the look of this game, Zakora commented one afternoon when she was visiting. It takes away what gave her her name. What's going to happen with the school's Hearts Warm and Eve party? Apple Bloom asked. Pinkie Pie always made that such a fun event. Pinkie makes the best muffins, Ditsy Doo said. But now there's no other baker as good as that can take her place. This last statement was an agreement among many of the ponies. While many ponies were eager to see Pinkie Pie beat Rainbow Dash at her competition, most of them were also disappointed that the party pony and one of the best bakers at Sugar Cube Corner was gone. The cake's productivity level was nowhere near where Pinkie Pie's had been and it had taken Applejack, Fluttershy, Rarity, and Twilight to create the same amount as Pinky had been able to make, and the quality still wasn't the same. Three months passed in this fashion. One day, Rainbow Dash came up to taunt Pinkie Pie. I'm surprised the alarm didn't go off the first week, she said. I'm impressed, Pink. I never thought you'd make it this far. Pinkie Pie scribbled a note and passed it through the slot. Anything for one of my friends. Besides, this is fun, smiley face. Rainbow Dash shrugged. I thought you'd miss talking all day. Pinkie Pie scribbled another note. Nope, I can finally hear myself think. Dash went away amused, but still confident. Twilight was sitting in between two large stacks of scrolls. There were fifty-two of them, in fact, all branded with the royal seal of a golden hoof. She had recently received a letter from Celestia, asking that she write an essay of each and every day to explain how she had come to each of the conclusions in the letter she had sent her. It was turning out to be a longer task than she had thought, but she had whittled it down a little each day. It was nice not having Pinky around bothering her all the time. She would always come over with a tray full of baked goods, balloons, and confetti saying something about a party. Two months before the bet, it was a Rainbow Dash completed 50 Sonic Rainbooms party. One week after that, it was the Mr. and Mrs. Cake have locked themselves up in their bedroom and are making odd noises party. One week before the bet, there was the Mr. and Mrs. Caker having another Philly party. After the invitation was given, five minutes after her arrival, Pinky would go about singing a song about the party that went on for another few minutes, and then she'd leave. Inevitably, she'd always return because she forgot something, like the date or the time, and interrupt Twilight for another half an hour talking about some random thing, before finally telling her the information. It usually caused Twilight to be an hour and a half behind schedule, but you couldn't schedule Pinky. Today, however, it was sad. Pinky had been in the box in the center of Ponyville for about six months now, and Twilight was beginning to miss the, mostly, once-weekly visits with the Pink Party Pony. Lately, Pound and Pumpkin Cake had been traveling by once a week on their way to school, with a small box in their bag containing six muffins or cupcakes. They'd talk for a while, Pumpkin about magic and Pound about flying lessons or any messages from Pinky, then be on their way about two minutes later. This time, the library was quiet. Too quiet. Pinky's absence had at first been welcome and gave Twilight the peace of mind she needed to complete her assignments and get much farther ahead of schedule. But things had become... dull. Pinky was smarter than she looked, and frequently gave Twilight some interesting insight the purple unicorn had ever thought of before. Things now were quiet and uninteresting. 
Suddenly, there came a rapping at Twilight's door. Twilight got up from between her stacks of scrolls and went over to the door to see who was there. The visitor was unexpected. Rainbow Dash was standing at the door looking panicked. Her hair was out of place and her eyes were wide with small pupils. She was panting and sweating as though she had flown very fast to reach her. Twilight! Dash panted. Twilight! You gotta help me! Twilight raised an eyebrow. Help? Help with what? My bank account! Dash exclaimed. Twilight scowled. She thought Rainbow would have a problem with friendship to send another letter into Celestia. It had been a while since I sent one, she thought. Why do you need help with your bank account? I'm having money troubles, Dash said. I haven't had as much work with the Weather Patrol lately and haven't been earning as much lately. If this keeps up and Pinky succeeds in the challenge, I won't have enough to pay her the full reward. You could just pay her back in smaller amounts when you get the money, Twilight said. That's the thing, Dash said. The contract we signed states I have to give her 10,000 bits as soon as she exits. I won't be able to fulfill my part of the contract. Twilight sighed. If you didn't spend so much on daring do books lately, you wouldn't be in this predicament. But I felt bad about borrowing them from the library over and over to reread them and one in my own personal set. The author's on 15 now, and I spent so many bits getting the full collection. You had no idea how quick they were gone, and the first is starting to become collector status. Oh, what a stupid mistake, but I... I have to find another way to either convince Pinky to leave, or rearrange the contract. You gotta help me, Twilight. Well, it was something more exciting than things had been lately. Alright, let's go and talk to Pinky and see if we can work something out. Twilight followed Dash to the box where Pinky was currently sleeping, wearing a pink sweater with a high neck that went almost to her chin. Her hair was less poofy than it had been before, and her fur was a shade or two darker than it had been a week ago when Twilight last checked out her books. The pink pony heard them coming, and woke up, and went immediately to her notepad and crayons as they stepped up. Hey, Pinky, Twilight called. How are you lately? Pinky scribbled a note. Fair enough. It gets lonely in here sometimes. Rainbow Dash walked up. Actually, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. Pinky's fur brightened as she wrote another note. Are you going to set up camp next to me? Then you could tell me fireside stories, and we'd have s'mores and everything. And we'd have s'mores and everything. It'd be fun. Sorry, Pinks. Not something to talk to you about in that way. Pinky's fur darkened again. Then what? I have a proposition. I'll give you 500 bits to let you out now. Pinky didn't hesitate for a second. We're only halfway through. I have plenty of steam left. Rainbow Dash pounded on the glass. Pinky, listen to me. I have 500 bits for you right now. I will give it to you right now if you leave. Pinky might have actually laughed if she hadn't been silent. Are you kidding me? You're caving in? I would have expected better from you, Dashie. I'm not giving up yet. Three months later, Dash had become something of a spectacle, though not in a good way. It had become a fairly common sight to see Rainbow Dash flying circles around the glass box Pinky was still living in. Sometimes it was lazy circles that were more shouting at the glass and Pinky shaking her head in response. Sometimes there would be a rainbow whirl from how fast the Pegasus was flying, and the things coming from the mouth of the Pegasus were too explicit to be written down, and most of the foals that were watching with their parents had their ears covered. Pinky, please! Why don't you just take the offer I'm making you of a thousand bits and leave? I can't now, came Pinky's response. There's only three months left. We're so close. How about one and a half thousand bits? Dash called. Nope. How about two thousand bits? Two thousand bits, right here and now. Pinky stopped shaking her head for a minute. She put her hoof to her chin and thought for a moment taking longer than usual to write out her answer. 
Eventually, Dash touched down and looked at the paper. Right now? Let's see it. Dash realized she had spoken too soon. Well, I actually need to retrieve it from the bank. Then that's just an hour or so more I'd have to wait. That's an hour or so closer to the deadline, so... No. Dash dropped down. How? How are you doing this? Pinky's fur darkened again. I can't say. Three months later, the entirety of Ponyville was out in the central plaza to see Pinky being released from the box. No one was able to believe that Pinkie Pie, the most talkative and hyper pony in all of Equestria, had been able to stay silent for an entire year. Pinkie was in a fancier scarf than usual that was covered in pink diamonds, courtesy of Rarity, and was jumping up and down in excitement. The only one not excited was Rainbow Dash. The mare was standing outside the box with Twilight, and waiting for an alarm to set off that announced the time Pinky could leave the box. But the blue mare was nervously stamping the ground and shivering, as though she could have used Pinky's scarf. Arguably, Rainbow was the more interesting mare to watch, what with her stamping and her shifting eyes and the way she nervously flew around and checked the box anywhere for signs of an alarm, waiting to set off within the final minutes of the bet. The alarm never sounded. The bell rang, and Twilight went before the box to make a quick speech. Congratulations to Pinkie Pie for winning the bet against Miss Rainbow Dash. Our pink party pony in the element of laughter has managed to stay silent for an entire year. But now, she will be able to speak and to hold parties again. Rainbow Dash couldn't tell, but she thought there might have been some sort of sad look in Pinky's eyes as Twilight commended her feet. Rainbow Dash went up to the podium. Before Twilight opens the box... I have an announcement to make. I cannot fulfill my end of the bargain. I spent my savings on the complete Daring Do collection, and with the lack of work I've been receiving from Weather Patrol, I don't have enough money to pay Pinky even half of the amount I promised her. I tried to make the bet too high stakes to make Pinky back out before the bet was finished. The crowd gasped. So instead, I shall do two things. Firstly, I will help Pinky at the cake shop and help her run it. In addition, I will not speak badly of Pinky or her constant talking ever again. Inside the box, Pinky started scribbling a note madly. Twilight opened the box. Well, Pinky, do you have you anything to say to that? Pinky continued writing on the pad, but wouldn't let anyone see what she was writing. Pinky? Twilight asked her. You're allowed to talk now. The bet's off. Why aren't you talking to us? Pinky finished the note and gave it to Twilight as the town fell silent and waited with bated breath as Twilight read it. The unicorn looked at the paper for a few minutes then shook her head and pulled it closer, as though there was something she had missed. Twilight looked up from the paper in disbelief. What? I... I... Well, Twilight? Dash asked impatiently. What does it say? Twilight looked at the note and read it slowly. I haven't told any pony except for Rarity about this. There's a reason that Rarity has been making and repairing all these scarves and sweaters for me. A week before I was placed into the box, I underwent a special surgery. I knew I couldn't finish the challenge normally. So I went over to Trottingham and had my focal cord severed. 
Rainbow Dash went over to Pinky and gingerly took the scarf wrapped around Pinky's neck in her mouth. With as much care as possible, Rainbow unwrapped the scarf from around her neck and let it drop onto the ground. She gasped, along with the entire town of Ponyville, as they saw the incision mark down the center of Pinky's neck. Shining Armor was uneasy. For the first time in thousands of years, there was a murder in Equestria, and with the worst consequences. The trial had gone swiftly with Shining Armor and the rest of the Celestial Guard's testimony contributing his piece to the case. And so it happened that an alicorn now rested in the dungeons. Shining Armor left the case, originally feeling pleased with himself. But as the moon now rested overhead, and the captain of the Celestial Guard sat on a balcony in the cool of the night, the White Unicorn could no longer feel peaceful or confident with his decision. A blue glow holding a white cup with gold trim came to a rest beside him. Shining Armor took the cup in his own aura and sipped the brown liquid inside, a bitter tea with honey and sugar to lighten the taste. As he did so, a young pink alicorn stepped up next to him and sat down next to Shining Armor on the balcony. What is it, dear? the alicorn asked. Is it about the trial earlier today? Yes, Cadence, Shining Armor replied. Don't be so worried, Princess Cadence said, bringing her head to his chin and nuzzling him. You did what was right. You should be proud of yourself. And yet I don't feel that way, the unicorn stallion replied, eyes downcast. I feel like there's some detail we missed. Some puzzle piece we don't have, like how we managed to miss that one time where Celestia had gone off to Ponyville to check on my little sister's progress and allowed Chrysalis to take your place. It was a small detail so far back we didn't even see it, and it nearly led to all of us being in great danger. Well, what other options presented themselves? Cadence asked. I mean, I wish things could have turned out another way, but you've run into a dead end with the evidence presented. I only wish the punishment were not so severe. Enough unicorn townspeople in Ponyville stepped in to prevent things from getting worse than they already were. Celestia could have given her some sort of pardon. I mean, she is royalty and could easily have done something differently. Instead, she just sidestepped the issue and didn't want to deal with anything. I'm sure she has many other things to do, Kanan said reassuringly. Shining Armor merely shook his head and finished his tea. Still don't seem comforted, Caden said. It's the first murder in thousands of years, and Celestia sidesteps the issue? I don't believe it. Caden's bitter lip. I'm sorry, dear. I don't know what else to say. Shining Armor couldn't say anything. Could write a letter to Twilight Sparkle, Caden suggested. I'm sure she could take the time to come here to Candlelot and be willing to listen. She and her friends were witnesses, right? Maybe they'd have another answer. I don't know if Princess Celestia would approve, Shining Armor said hesitantly. I mean, she and... Oh, don't worry about what Celestia would think, Cadence interrupted. If you need Twilight to come here to comfort you and get some brother and sister time, I'm sure she wouldn't mind it a bit. Shining Armor sighed and nodded. I suppose I should write a letter to her. Good. And do remember to come into bed when you're done, Caden said. It gets cold at night up this far in the tower. And she trotted off to bed again. Shining Armor got up and went to his desk in another section of the tower and began to write. 
Dear Twilight Sparkle, I need you to come to Canterlot as swiftly as possible. I am uneasy regarding my decision in this last case, and need to talk to you about it. Your friends can come along if you want them to. Your brother, Shining Armor. Twilight Sparkle looked at the hastily scrawled letter that had come in the mail that morning. At first, she had been angry. The gray Pegasus mail mare had been rattling her mailbox since before the sun even rose. Her anger quickly turned to happiness when she saw the letter was from her brother, but became concerned when she saw the jerky scrawl that was so unlike her brother's usual hoof writing. And the subject of the note wasn't any better. The last case? Twilight wondered aloud. Does he mean... Twilight didn't think about it very long. She quickly went upstairs and started poking the bundle of blue blankets inside a small basket next to her bed. Spike! Twilight called out. The blue bundle quivered a bit before a purple and green dragon head popped out from underneath. What is it? Why are you up so early? Do you need me to add fire to something? If not, I'll be going back to sleep until a normal waking hour. Spike, I need to go to Canterlot for a few days, Twilight said. My brother wanted me to come over swiftly, but he didn't say when he wanted me to come. This is so confusing. Write a note telling him I'm on my way to the Ponyville train station and coming to Canterlot as fast as I can. And please add in that note about him not putting a specific time he needed me to get there. It's making me so confused. Spike grumbled a bit more, but got up out of the blankets and went over to the desk on the lower floor of the Ponyville library, taking a few minutes to make a cup of coffee before writing the letter. Once the letter was sent with his magical flame, Spike drank a cup of coffee and carried an extra cup up the stairs to where Twilight Sparkle was deciding what research reports went with her to Canterlot to show the princess and which could stay behind. Shouldn't it be more important to see what your brother needs, instead of pondering over whether or not you're going to take a research report on levels of friendship in fish? Spike asked. I'll be in Canterlot spending time with my brother, Twilight said. At some point we'll be seeing Princess Celestia, and I'll be able to tell her how my research report on friendship is going, and about the studies I found on friendship in other creatures. Spike picked up the note on the nightstand next to Twilight's bed and read it over. Doesn't sound like you'll be seeing Princess Celestia much if she's preoccupied as she's going to be. Well, if she can't read it, I'll be able to share it with Princess Luna, and maybe she'll learn a thing or two from it as well. At the mention of Princess Luna, Spike dropped the cup of coffee over the floor, causing Twilight to drop her reports. Spike, could you be a little less clumsy and help me decide? Spike blinked. You really don't know. Twilight went over to Spike, studying him. Don't know what? Spike shook his head and went back downstairs to make a new cup of coffee. It's nothing. I'm sure you'll find out from Shining Armor. Twilight sighed and packed her friendship reports and a few books on animal behavior before heading downstairs. Spike presented her with a coffee, and Twilight went to the station for the first express train to Canterlot, noting especially that the captain of the Celestial Guard had called her there. The station manager immediately gave her a ticket to Canterlot, and set her on the earliest and fastest train, and soon Twilight Sparkle was speeding along towards the Royal City. Upon her arrival in the Canterlot station later that morning, Twilight Sparkle was greeted by two pure white Pegasus stallions in gleaming gold armor. Twilight bowed to them as she approached. You are Twilight Sparkle? one asked. Yes, Twilight responded. We were sent here by your brother and the captain of the Celestial Guard, Shining Armor, to pick you up and escort you to the castle. We have a special coach waiting for you just outside the station. Oh, Twilight said as one of the Pegasi picked up her suitcase. Thank you. The guards escorted Twilight over to the chariot and attached themselves to the front of the coach. 
Twilight and her bags were loaded into the fancy coach before the Pegasi began dashing through the streets of Canterlot. Once they had gained a fair amount of speed, Twilight felt the coach lift off the ground and start sailing over the crowded city streets. Twilight stuck her head outside of one of the windows. Where exactly are we going? Special entrance to the castle, one of the guards responded back. Shining Armor made it clear he wanted to keep this whole thing private. Twilight slipped back inside the coach to think. Spike not wanting to talk about Princess Luna? Shining Armor insisting that a simple conversation with his little sister was going to be private? And that same Shining Armor sent a letter to Ponyville by urgent mail, asking Twilight to speak with him in Canterlot as quickly as possible? Something was strange, Twilight was sure. And it had to do with a lot more than just not setting a specific meeting time. Twilight didn't have long to think. The coach soon began to descend in the back of Canterlot Castle, along a makeshift runway manned by two more Pegasi in golden armor. It wasn't long before Twilight could see Shining Armor making his way out of the castle with two more guards and waiting alongside the runway. And waiting alongside the runway as the Pegasi in charge of the coach slowed down and gracefully landed. One of the guards opened the door, and another helped Twilight Sparkle out before getting her suitcase. Put that one in the spare bedroom in my suite. Shining Armor commanded before taking off his helmet and addressing Twilight directly. I'm sorry I called you out here on such short notice, little sis. Short notice, Twilight said. It's less notice than when you invited me as best mayor for the royal wedding to Princess Miyamore Cadenza. Speaking of which, how is my favorite full sitter? Eager to see you, Shining Armor replied. But she is preoccupied until this evening. You'll get a chance to talk to her about it eventually. For now, we'll simply head up to my suite and have some breakfast. We have many things we need to talk about. Is that why you called me here? Twilight asked. If you wanted to talk, you could have just talked to me through mail. There are things I want to show you that aren't done justice through mail, Shining Armor said. It's better that you came here. While her brother's voice was much more serious than she anticipated, Twilight otherwise assumed nothing much was wrong other than a simple conversation with her brother. However, Twilight's fears from her flight to the castle were reaffirmed when she saw a door with a crescent moon on it soon after entering the castle with two of Celestia's guards near it and a sign saying, Danger! Keep out! Is it about Princess Luna? Twilight asked. I'm afraid so, Shining Armor said. Twilight waited until they had arrived in Shining Armor's and Princess Cadence's wing of the castle, and Shining had commanded two of his guards to stand outside before setting themselves down to a large salad Shining Armor had ordered. Twilight served herself a plate, and watched as Shining Armor had served himself before starting her barrage of questions. What was with the letter? Why did you want me to come so quickly? Why didn't you tell me about this earlier? Why did you want me specifically to come? Why can't you talk with anyone else about this? What is going on with Princess Luna? Shining Armor raised a hoof and waited for Twilight to become quiet again before responding. I called you here because of a case that went on recently regarding the first murder in Equestria since Nightmare Moon was banished. The suspect and as of right now, confirmed murderer, is Princess Luna. Twilight gasped. Evidence suggested that Princess Luna was being verbally attacked by some ponies near Ponyville. Reports also say that Princess Luna temporarily transformed into Nightmare Moon and killed one of the mares harassing her. Two more remain hospitalized since the event. If the guard and some residents of Ponyville had not intervened, Luna likely would have killed more. But why? Twilight asked. What? What is going on? Because of the seriousness of the crime Luna has been charged with, she is going to undergo execution. 
The sentence was that Princess Luna is to be publicly rocketed to the sun and thrown into it tomorrow morning. That's not fair! Twilight shouted, pounding the table and causing salad to spill all over the table and the floor. If he had noticed the mess, Shining Armor didn't say anything about it. The reason I called you here is because I was part of the testimony against Luna, because some of the guard under my command were called to stop her. I had to present their evidence in court on behalf of the members of the guard involved, but I do not feel at ease with my decision. Why don't you plead with Princess Celestia then? Twilight asked. I'm sure she could do something about it. Believe me, Shining Armor replied. I want to. And Cadence suggested the same thing, but Celestia won't hear anything else about it. She sadly told me the case was closed, and she wouldn't have Nightmare Moon taking control of her sister again. So the best thing to do is sentence her to death? Twilight sobbed. That's not fair! It's just not fair! I've persuaded Celestia to do one thing for me, Shining Armor replied. You're allowed to go down to the dungeons with an escort and talk with Princess Luna for a short while. You two have been close friends since Nightmare Night, and we both realize you may need this. Twilight nodded and tried to wipe the tears from her eyes. Thank you, she said, but had a feeling it wouldn't be enough. If you don't mind, I would like to see her right now. I shall inform the guard you will want to see her, Shining Armor nodded. In the meantime, I have a few more things to do until this evening. But you are allowed free reign of our wing of the castle. Celestia's wing is available under special conditions at this time. Twilight nodded and followed her brother out of the room, where he spoke to the guards. Twilight Sparkle has requested an audience with Princess Luna, currently in the dungeons. Take her there and keep watch on her. Give her as much time as she needs. This is an order approved by Princess Celestia. Yes, sir, the guard said, and began to lead Twilight through the halls of Canterlot Castle. Twilight had never been to the dungeons. She never had reason to, and often Celestia hadn't permitted her to even go near them. She had sometimes seen a few ponies go into the dungeons while walking and talking with Celestia, but she never seen any pony leave. A few did, but she never heard of them. The dungeon had little light and low ceilings. One of the guards had to ask Twilight to carry a torch for them so they could see the darker corners of the dungeons. Twilight walked through with a guard in front and a guard in back as they descended a staircase into the dark depths. Twilight felt a shiver run through her back, never imagining some place this cold and dark could be underneath the beauty and warmth of Canterlot Castle. At the bottom of the set of stairs, one of the guards took a key and locked the door before taking another key and unlocking one of the doors into a much larger room. Twilight was guided inside, and instructed to place the torch in a holder near the entrance. She walked in, and went over to a chair where she seated herself down, as one of the guards went over to and opened another door. Through the door the guard opened, stepped a very weary-looking alicorn covered in deep blue fur, with a darker flank and a flowing mane looked like it was made from the stars. Her blue eyes rested on twilight sparkle, and her wings extended happily as she ran over to the mare and took her in the, her hooves. Twilight Sparkle, the alicorn said. It had been far too long since we last talked. Yes, Luna, Twilight said. I believe the last time we talked was the royal wedding. It is a pity we haven't been able to see each other since then in more favorable circumstances, Luna said. I feared I wouldn't be able to talk to you. What happened, Luna? Twilight said. Please tell me it isn't true. I was flying around one night to stretch my wings when I noticed a few ponies talking amongst themselves. The arguments were between those who were having trouble with the royalty 
and me and my sister's policies, and those who didn't mind them. A unicorn began firing off some magic, hurting one of the others. I stepped in and intended to use my magic to separate them. Before I knew it, a few random shots of magic were fired, and the unicorn was dead and an earth pony hurt. Luna looked at Twilight with pleading eyes. You believe me, don't you? Luna had said things so earnestly and straightforward with Twilight that the unicorn almost immediately knew she wasn't lying. I believe you, Twilight said. I know you've gotten better since the Nightmare Moon incident. You may have had some problems blending in at first, but it was still better than it had been. And you had made so much progress by the wedding, it, it, it couldn't have been you. I don't know who it was, Luna admitted. But I do know I use no magic. Why doesn't Celestia listen to any of this? Twilight asked. Because the families of the ponies hurt were disappointed and still believe the legends told of Nightmare Moon, Luna said. If one of them was for us before, they were all against us afterwards unless something was done to appease them. The family of the pony killed never came forward, and we weren't able to find them. Oh, princess, Twilight said, now beginning to sob into Luna's mane. It was soft and cool and soothing, like a gentle night breeze, and Twilight didn't want to let go. I wish I had known. I wish I could have been there to help you. Don't cry for me, Twilight Sparkle, Luna said, though Twilight could tell she was beginning to cry herself. If you are ever up studying at night, look up at the moon and remember me. Look at the stars and the patterns I put in the sky and remember me. No one ever truly leaves us if we keep the memories of them alive. But we've had so little time, Twilight sobbed. I wish we had more. We had only just become friends. I know, Luna said. If only Celestia had the sense to listen and didn't cave in under the pressure. Twilight remained there for a little while longer, closing her eyes and sobbing into Luna's mane as the alicorn took her hoof and gently held her close, all the while trying not to cry herself. Twilight wanted to stay in the cool of the alicorn's mane forever, and wished she had more time to speak with Luna in person. She had grown fond of the mare in her letters to her, it was pretty sure Luna had been herself, yet now she was already being torn away from her. After a while, Twilight had calmed down enough to release Luna. I should probably go, she said. Maybe, maybe I could try talking to Celestia since I am her favorite student. She would listen to me. I would hope so, Twilight Sparkle, Luna said. And please... Tell your brother I forgive him. It wasn't his fault I'm here. Twilight hugged Luna one more time before the guards placed Luna back into her room and locked her away. Twilight took the torch again, and the guards led her back up the staircase and out of the dungeon. The walk up took less time than the walk down, and Twilight soon found themselves entering the castle, now already in evening. Have we really spent that long down there? Twilight said as she placed the torch near the dungeon entrance. I think you fell asleep for a while, one of the guards responded. But you kept crying, so neither of us could really tell. There was also the fact that Celestia and Shining Armor approved you to stay as long as you needed, so long as you attended dinner. We were going to tell you, but you finished conveniently enough we didn't say anything. Twilight nodded. It is time to escort you to the dining hall. Princess Celestia, Princess Cadence, and Shining Armor are awaiting your arrival before starting. Twilight nodded again. Lead the way. At the dining hall, Princess Celestia was sitting in her usual seat at the head of the table, 
with Princess Cadence on her right and an empty chair on her left. Shining Armor sat on Cadence's opposite side, and a servant was holding a chair out for Twilight Sparkled, next to Princess Celestia herself. Twilight entered and walked over to where the servant was waiting. Welcome, my faithful student, Princess Celestia said, her voice echoing across the chamber towards Twilight. Shining Armor told me you were spending time with Princess Luna in the dungeons. Twilight didn't say anything. She remained quiet as the servant pushed her chair in and brought a plate of salad to her. Shining Armor nervously poked his salad. Cadence smiled at Twilight, but the purple unicorn didn't return it, so she nervously poked her salad out of a lack of anything else to do. Why didn't you do anything? Twilight said suddenly. Celestia frowned. I did what I could. Alas, the evidence was too much. But you could have pardoned your own sister, Twilight said. She didn't do anything. Why didn't you? You must understand I did what I did because otherwise we'd have an even larger problem on our hands. But you have power? You could have used your power? Twilight Sparkle, Celestia said as calmly as she could. One thing you must learn is that neither I, nor Princess Cadence, nor Princess Luna abuse our power. I believe Luna's story, but to abuse my power to defuse any conflict would not be an appropriate use for it. But flinging your sister into the sun is... Celestia placed a hoof on Twilight's shoulder and rested her head on top of hers but the unicorn pulled away from the gesture. I agree with Twilight, Cadence said. Perhaps there is something else that could be done so that this could all be avoided. I do not think our powers were meant for crushing dissenters, but I also don't believe that our powers were meant to fling one of our own into the sun as execution. And Luna's powers were not meant to bring out Nightmare Moon, Celestia said. But that same pony tried to plunge the land into eternal night. I am afraid that, should this get out of hand, she will try to do so again. I could stay here, Twilight pleaded, feeling a rage build within her. I could work with her. Y you have the power to pardon her, and I am close enough friends with her that I could stay here. Or she could come back to Ponyville with me. Can't you do something? Celestia's face was downcast. Hush, my student. Calm down. I am not your enemy. Twilight felt the angry feelings leave her before Celestia continued. There's nothing I can do now. Aside from running the risk of Nightmare Moon's reappearance, I also risk those who would overthrow me if they saw me become a coward. Twilight sighed. I'm going to bed, she said weakly as she excused herself from the table. Aren't you going to eat anything? Cadence called after her. I'm not hungry anymore. Twilight called back as she ran out of the room and back to her room in Shining Armor's wing before throwing herself on the bed. A heavy weight rested on her back and on her eyes as Twilight collapsed into the bed, sobbing. She couldn't even use her magic to cover herself with how little she focused on her. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the door. Twilight didn't respond, so the knock came again. Twilight, Princess Celestia called. I want to talk to you. Leave me alone, you coward, Twilight said. I don't want to talk with a princess who won't save her own sister from an unjust sentence. You are my idol, Celestia. But now you're nothing but an alicorn who wants to save her own popularity. I don't want to talk with you anymore. For a long while, not another word came from the other side of the door. Finally, Celestia spoke, but her words did not reassure Twilight. The execution will be at eight in the morning tomorrow. Shining Armor and Cadence will be in attendance, and you are welcome to come along with I hope you can forgive me. 
For now, sleep. Celestia's hoofed steps started up and quickly faded away. Twilight felt her energy leave her as she finally closed her eyes and fell asleep. A few hours later, Twilight awoke to a knocking at her door. Who is it? Twilight called groggily. It's me, Cadence, Cadence responded. It's nearly time for the execution. Twilight got up and turned around to the window to find that she could still see the stars and the full moon outside. But it's not even dawn, she said. I know, Cadence said. Even with all her magical strength, Celestia has been unable to raise the sun this morning, and Luna has been unable to lower her moon. However, the execution is still underway at eight. Twilight grabbed a black cloak from the room and put it on before walking outside to meet Cadence, dressed in a larger but fairly similar black cloak. The two walked together to find Shining Armor and Celestia in the entry hall, with Luna carried in Celestia's yellow aura. The dark blue Alicorn's eyes closed, though Twilight noticed she was not asleep. A few tears were coming from her eyes. Twilight followed Cadence out into the growing crowd as Princess Celestia walked out onto a balcony and set Luna down between herself and Shining Armor. Twilight and Cadence stood in the front of the crowd as Shining Armor erected a barrier in front of the crowd so they could not approach the royal family. Some of the ponies present were questioning the reason for the execution, but an ever-growing number were complaining about the royals and how they knew Princess Luna was a threat to their safety and well-being and heralded a return of Nightmare Moon. Twilight wished they wouldn't talk that way, but she had nothing she could say to defend her. Princess Celestia stepped forward and began to address the mob. Citizens of Equestria, Today, we gather here to witness the execution of Princess Luna for the murder of a pony and the serious assault against two other ponies. Today, we rid ourselves of the hiding place of Nightmare Moon and prevent her from coming back to cause harm to us again. The crowds cheered and chanted for Luna's execution. Celestia turned to Luna. Princess Luna, do you have any last words? I do, Princess Luna said. You may notice that the sun has not risen today, and the moon will not lower itself to make way for the dawn. I am sorry to let you know that both of these events are out of mine or my sister's power. Neither of us have been able to do our duties because even the sun and the moon realize the damage you have all done by condemning me. The sun shall not rise, and light shall not return, until you realize what you have done wrong. Princess Luna turned to Celestia. As for you, my sister, my cowardly sister... Do not blame these ponies for what you yourself have turned to in order to keep your own fame up. You have thought you could keep the corruption of the commoners out of the castle, but you yourself have turned to petty reasoning in order to keep yourself and your people satiated. As though that could have put your mind at ease. This could have been solved easier if you hadn't allowed me to undergo this. Princess Luna then turned and walked towards the balcony. Her eyes quickly found Twilight Sparkle at the head of the crowd with Cadence. As for you, Twilight Sparkle, she said calmly and gracefully, you are a great magician and full of knowledge. Do not let the same corruption that has tainted my sister fall onto you and let it spoil what I saw in you. Twilight's lip quivered. Princess Celestia stepped up to Luna. Do you have anything else to say? Luna shook her head. Celestia nodded, then let her horn glow brightly with her aura. Luna was surrounded in the aura and lifted a short way off the ground. 
Goodbye, equestrians, Luna called out. Enjoy your cowardly tyrant. Suddenly, there was a bright flash of light and a fireball rapidly receding away from the streets of Canterlot. The crowd watched in awe as the flame burst into existence, then began to climb at an ever-increasing pace until the fireball had disappeared into the darkening sky. At the same time, Celestia shot upwards, spreading her wings as the sun finally appeared in the sky. A large solar flare erupted from the surface, so large it could be seen in the streets of Canterlot, and returned into the sun as the crowd cheered. It was then that everything came crashing down. The sun began to lower, and would not raise no matter how much magic Celestia used to bring it back again. The stress began to take its toll on the Alicorn Princess as she collapsed onto the floor of the balcony. The lights in the streets of Canterlot turned on in succession as Equestria collapsed into darkness. Twilight and Cadence shot up the staircase toward fallen Alicorn. Princess Celestia! Twilight called. What happened? Are you okay? Celestia weakly opened up one eye and looked around at Twilight, Cadence, Shining Armor, and the guards standing around her before looking up at the black sky. What have I done? she said, then closed her eyes. Guards! Shining Armor shouted. Get her to the hospital wing, now! A few Pegasi guards came and surrounded Princess Celestia and their aura, before opening the doors to the castle and rushing the alicorn inside. "'What's going on?' came a shout from the crowd. "'What happened to the princess?' came another shout. "'Why hasn't the sun risen? Where's the moon?' some pony else shouted. Twilight Sparkle went up to the balcony and jumped onto it. "'Listen up!' she shouted." Shocked by the power and command in the Twilight's voice, the crowds fell quiet. Twilight gulped. In case you haven't realized it, this is all your fault. A collective gasp rose up. How dare you accuse us like that? What did we do? said one pony. You heard Princess Luna, Twilight said. This is all your fault. You refused to listen to reason, and instead wanted whatever you wanted. You didn't listen to what your princess of the night had to say. Instead, you only cared about whatever you wanted. A few pegasi started flying around from all different directions. One of the pegasi landed on the balcony next to Twilight and began to address the crowd. Listen to me, citizens of Canterlot, said the first pegasus to the crowd. The darkness is not just here. The darkness has also eclipsed Ponyville. The crowd gasped, including Twilight and Cadence. That's where the murder was committed. Listen to me, citizens of Canterlot, a second Pegasus said. The darkness is not just here. The darkness has also eclipsed Trottingham. Another gasp. That's where that one politician was attacked. A third Pegasus landed next to Twilight on the balcony. Listen to me, citizens of Canterlot, he said to the crowd. The darkness is not just here. The darkness has also eclipsed the whole of the Griffin Kingdom. The crowd was silent. But why? a voice finally asked. The darkness has eclipsed places where harmony has failed to solve problems, Cadence said, looking up into the night sky. Wherever harmony has tried and failed, but has not been the answer, then darkness shall eclipse it. Our society seems idyllic, but because not even us alicorns are perfect, then even we must face the consequences. Perhaps Princess Luna is the one who has the last laugh, for she no longer must suffer the hatred and lack of harmony that now has covered our dear Equestria. 
I suppose the promise that Nightmare Moon made not but two years ago shall come true. The night shall last forever. One week after that, it was the Mr. and Mrs. Cake who have locked themselves up in their bedroom and are making odd noises party. What the fuck? Did I seriously just fucking read that? Oh my god. You know what? Screw it. I've read weirder. One week before the bet, there was the Mr. and Mrs. Cake are having another Philly party. God damn it. <laughs> This is why it's important to read the story before you read it out loud.